Well, I'm excited about this evening and sharing, and I don't know about you, but I just have not gotten over Easter this year. It just, every day is like Easter morning, and I know that the Lord is doing something in my life and in my heart, and I I just feel closer to Him than I ever have. And like the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, I just want to know the Lord in the power of His resurrection and in the fellowship of His sufferings. Hallelujah. And those things are just ringing in my heart and in my life at this season in my life. And I have shared with you how that I experienced death and that transition from this life to the afterlife and some of the things that I experienced. And there's two things that have come up since I shared on those things constantly now, everywhere I go. Would you please just take a whole hour and talk about what happened? And number two, in passing, in my testimonial, I keep referring to the sting of death. The sting of death and how Jesus has removed the sting of, of death. And so many people have asked, could you instead of talk about that in passing, go ahead and share on that. So I didn't feel comfortable and I still don't feel comfortable yet sharing my entire testimony on what happened to me um, because I'm really still processing after a couple of years. There were things that happened that unless you experience something like I experienced, it's hard to communicate how that I don't know if I was in my body when I was experiencing these things or out of my body. At the time, it seemed like I could divide when I was in my body and Sue praying and, and not letting me go on. I, I kept thinking that the Lord gave me a choice whether to stay in heaven and with Him or to come back. And after I recovered, I found out I didn't have a choice. Sue was rebuking the devil and... <laughs> Commanded me to come back. I kept feeling something pull on me, you know. What is that? It's, it's Sue. You don't mess with Sue, amen. And so, <laughs> and so one of the things that, that I definitely communicated in my testimonial, and Jacob has, Pastor Jacob has ministered on this often, is that heaven and earth are closer than we understand in our carnal minds. And in my experience, I literally just stepped over and it's like you're in the presence of the Lord, the unveiled presence of the Lord. And communication there is so different than communication here. But then all of a sudden, you're just right back into your body and you can't explain all of that. And yet the presence of the Lord is still there in your body. And so I'm still trying to figure out again, was that my imagination? Was that just my own mind? Was I in my body? Uh, or out of my body. And so I don't know that I'll ever get it all processed, but I did want to talk about the sting of death, the sting of death, because there were so many things that fascinated me looking back on how easy it is to die. Now, I'm talking to believers, okay? I'm talking to believers, and I need to make that clear, that as a believer in Jesus, you are so united to Jesus, your spirit has been so united to the Spirit of the Lord, for you to die is gain, and for you to live is Christ. Is Christ. I am crucified with Christ. You've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live, yet not you, but Christ now lives in you. And this mystery of being born again, this mystery of our spirits being united and that we're housed in this body, this temple, is truly a miraculous mystery. How that Christ could truly be on the inside of us, and, and we still feel weakness. Anybody besides me coming to know your mortality? You know, when you're 20, not only are you dumber than a rock. Now, if you're 20, you're an exception to the rule by being here. But aside from not being very bright, you just think you're never going to die and you're invincible. And man, as time goes on, how many of you know you get humbled? And it's like, wait a minute, there's a, there's a spirit on the inside of here. But this body has to be dealt with in our journey of faith. And if you don't understand the power of the resurrection and you don't understand 
how Jesus has taken the sting out of death, then you can go through life with a lot of anxiety and worry and concern that can actually be harmful to your body instead of being at total peace. And so let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm going to start, start reading in verse, in verse 50. And we're going to talk about the sting of death and how Jesus has removed for a Christian, for a believer, the sting of, of death. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery is a divine secret that's hidden in God. It's not hidden from us. It's hidden for us. And so I, I tell you this mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. At what trump? Whatever he's talking about will not happen until the very last trump of God. And I don't have time to get into all the trumpets in the Bible and the, the symbolism of trumpets and the voice of God, and the word of God, and the declaration of God in trumpets. But there are trumpets still to come of God speaking that will shake heaven and the earth. And ultimately there will be a last trumpet of God. There will be a last declaration of God and Jesus will come back. And Jesus will come back. He won't come back till the last trump though. And something miraculous is going to happen at that last trump, the day of the Lord. For the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immorality, immortality, I'd, I'd recommend putting on some immorality. Do not put on any immorality. <laughs> immortality. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what you think about what he's saying or, or even when I'm done, if you're confused, you need to give God thanks for the victory. Where does it come from? It comes from Jesus. Jesus has given us victory over every single thing in this life as we learn to walk by faith. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So we've got this declaration of a last trump, the end of this age as we know it. And at that time, the dead are going to be raised. Those that have died in Christ will be raised. Those that have died without Christ will be raised. But he makes this strong if you, get, if you will, announcement that flesh and blood, your body as it is right now, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You've inherited the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is in you. Your born again spirit is not corruptible. It's incorruptible. It's immortal. And it has entered the kingdom of, of God and the kingdom of God in it. But these bodies have to either be sown in what we call death... Or, if we're alive at the last trump, at the coming of the Lord, then these bodies are what's going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This corruptible body. Your body's still corruptible. Your spirit's not corruptible. But your body is, is still corruptible. Your body can experience immorality, but not your spirit. And so this has to be taken off either sown in death, and then resurrected, incorruptible, and mortal. Or the Lord comes and it's changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's your body that will be changed at that last, at that last trump. And there is a generation, a whole generation of Christians 
that will experience being changed in the air as we meet the Lord in the air. That could happen at any minute, hallelujah. Lord, I pray you don't tarry. Amen. And so, and so he says that in verse 56 is where I want to hone in on. He says that, that the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. That is a profound statement, saints. That is absolutely huge. Because Jesus has given us victory and has delivered us from both sin and the law. Amen. And when you understand that, you begin to, to deepen your walk with the Lord and your, and your love for Him, your appreciation of Him. You know, without an understanding that is progressive of the cross, people never deepen their love in the Lord. But as you come to know what Jesus really did for you and how that he has literally taken the sting out of death and the strength out of the law over you, there's an intimacy that this produces. This is a love for the Lord that goes beyond the, the average Christian in today's culture and in today's society. And the Lord loves you and cannot love you any more or any less than He loves you right now. But how many of you know you can love the Lord more if you come to know Him? If you come to know Him. And as I go through this, I pray that the Holy Spirit will help deepen your love for the Lord, your commitment to the Lord, your thankfulness to the Lord. I mean, we're all going through things, it seems like. We're all facing things. Every one of us, it just seems like. And yet, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, our love for the Lord should continue to grow, continue to increase. Our appreciation for what He really did. Again, I haven't gotten over Easter. I'm not sure this year I'll get over Easter. I don't know where I'm going to preach next Easter, but you don't want to be there. <laughs> I'm going to just blow up on the stage. <laughs> because when you think of the sting literally being taken out of death. And when you think as we live this life, the strength of the law has been taken out over you. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Go to, go to Hebrews chapter 2 real quick. And then we're going to talk about how Jesus has delivered us from sin and the law. In Hebrews... Chapter 2, familiar passage, but it's still, I can't read it too much, or in this case, share on it, on it too much. Because again, death and the fear of death and the bondage associated with death is how Satan ensnared the whole world. The whole world. This fear of death. This uncertainty of death and beyond the grave. I guarantee you, death is certain, but a lot of people enter death with uncertainty. And God does not want a Christian to enter death, physical death, with any doubt in their heart. With any doubt in their heart, any fear in their heart. A fear of God's wrath, a fear of God's judgment, a fear of God's rejection. One of the things I shared in my testimonial when I was talking to Jesus that was overwhelming was the total sense of peace and acceptance. That even in Him telling me I wasn't done, because I asked the Lord, was I done? Meaning, have I, have I run my race? Have I finished my course? Have I, have I fulfilled all the will of God for my life? And that's when the Lord said, no. And I had no sense, though, if I'd have said, I want to stay here. This is just, this is good. Lord, just ignore Sue. <laughs> That's probably what I had to say. 
If, if, if I'd have said I want to stay, listen to me, that would have meant I didn't finish my course. I didn't do everything God told me to do. I didn't complete whatever assignment He gave me, and yet I felt no guilt, no condemnation, no rejection. He was as pleased with me if I'd have stayed as He is with me right now, coming back and being with you. That's, that's amazing to me. Because you would think, growing up in religion, that, man, if you didn't fulfill God's will, and you didn't run your race, and you didn't complete your course, man, He is going to just lash out at you, and beat you, and just, it's terrible how you have failed. So, none of that. None of that. And yet, many people still live with all this guilt and this condemnation and this misunderstanding of how God loves you and how cool it really is. So how did Jesus remove the sting of death and how did He remove the strength of sin, which was the law? That's what I want to talk about and explain how. Just quickly, I can just tell you though, the, the bottom line is, how many of you know He bore our sins in His body on the tree? That we being dead to sin now should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes now we are healed. See, Jesus took all of your sins. He took all of my sins in His body on the tree and literally embraced the death that sin has brought into this world. Into this world. See, Jesus didn't just take my sins and it was no big deal. He took my death. He took my punishment. He took all my guilt. He took all my condemnation and punishment and wrath from God for all my sins. And when I say all, I mean all. There is no wrath from God to any of you who know Him. Secondly, He destroyed the power and strength of sin by fulfilling the law. And I'm actually excited about my ending still in my beginning. Because, man, I spent decades confused about what does it mean that Jesus fulfilled the law. And so we're going to look at some of that. Let's look at Hebrews 2 here real quick. Verse 14 Insomuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power, that had the power of death, that is the devil, and to release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Man, that is just so rich. Destroy him that had the power of death. Jesus was after something when he came to this earth. Jesus was on an assignment when he came to this earth. Jesus was after the keys of hell, death, and the grave. And the grave. And the only way for him to conquer, destroy, annihilate in the sense of render inoperative the devil was to go through death. And it wasn't his death. It was your death he tasted of. Every time I've said this, I get a letter. So do not write me. And I'm, I'm, I don't know how I can say it any clearer. Jesus... Had he not gone to the cross and chose to bear your sins and my sins would have never died. He would still be alive today. And I don't maybe, maybe that's throwing people. He would still be alive today. Well, Pastor Dwayne, don't you know he's alive? I'm talking about him in his body that Mary provided for him. I'm talking about in his earthly ministry and body, he'd have never died. He would have he would have aged to about 33, and he would look like, feel like, 33, 2,000 years later. And he would be in that same body that Mary provided him in his earthly ministry. See, the fact that Jesus died says there had to be sin at the cross. 
The wages of sin is death. And Jesus had no sin. There was no sin in his body, no sin in his mind, and no sin in his spirit. He was the second Adam, just like the first Adam would have never died had he not sinned. Adam, the first man, would still be on the... Pl I don't know what I'm not saying. This is clear as a bell. Adam died because of sin. Jesus died because of sin, but the difference between Adam, the first man, and Jesus, the second man, is Adam personally sinned and died. Jesus had no sin of his own, but died. How could that be? He took your sin and my sin in his body on the tree by choice and died your death. He didn't just die for you. He died as you. Oh, Jesus. Haven't felt some goosebumps in a while. He didn't just die for me. He died as me. He had no death of his own. So whose death did he have? Mine. He embraced the substance, the pains of death. He didn't just die. He died your very death, your very pain, and the sting of death is what he embraced. We still have not probed the depths of the death of Jesus. That it wasn't natural, it was supernatural. It wasn't anything you can imagine. He embraced the whole world's cancer. He embraced the whole world's diseases. He embraced the whole world's pain and brokenness and sorrow. Everything that sin brings into this world. Into the flesh of Jesus. Why did he do that? That he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus did not annihilate Satan like wiping him out where there is no devil. There is no Satan. But he crushed his head was what was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3. And rendered him inoperative. Stripped him. And it would take weeks. It's a series Jacob probably needs to take up. About how God had given. What? <laughs> what? He needs to preach on this. <laughs> if he can't do it, Zach can do it. Hallelujah. <laughs> but we need to be reminded how Adam was given all this authority, all this power, all this dominion. And when he sinned, Satan hijacked. All the authority God gave man and the power and dominion God gave man and then used it against man to destroy him. Jesus has reversed this. He took it back from Satan and after the resurrection, he said, all power is now given unto me both in heaven and in earth. You do something now. You go. You preach the gospel. Those things need to be stirred up in us on a regular basis. That all Satan has is the power of deception. Lies. Lie, 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 lie. Liar, liar. Pants on fire. The devil's pants are on fire. He's such a liar. He has to deceive us to ensnare us and use the very power and authority delegated back to us by God now against us. And this is why truth is so important and what we're doing right now is so important. Always. And so Jesus has destroyed him that had the power of death. How did he do that? How did he do that? Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter, chapter 5, verse 17. I struggled with these patches, passages for a while. 
And I sure thank God for understanding them now. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I didn't come to destroy the law. I didn't come to destroy the prophets. I come to fulfill. Now, here's where it gets dicey. And I'll, I'll skirt around this and keep peace. I really will. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. So Jesus said, look, in regards to the law, I didn't come to just wipe it out. I didn't come to destroy it. There is a purpose for the law. There's a place for the law. And as Christians, we have to navigate through this grace law issue our entire lives. And even what does it mean not to be under the law? I am no longer under the law. But that doesn't mean I'm lawless. It doesn't mean I have no boundaries. Understanding of right and wrong. So what does it mean that he said, I come not to destroy it, but to fulfill it? Again, do you realize, many of you don't, it's almost a rhetorical question, but do you realize what our world would be like if we didn't have the law of Moses? Look at what our world is becoming right now with the law of Moses. People don't know right from wrong. Before the law, sin was in the world, but where there was no law, sin wasn't imputed. Until the law of Moses, sin was destroying and Satan was using sin to destroy the human race. And I can't imagine how messed up people's minds were without the law of Moses. Because one of the many purposes of the law is to make sin known. This is why God gave the law, was to make sin known. To show you what sin is. Because if you don't have God's input, you don't have God's law, you become a law unto yourself, and you literally call good evil and evil good. You justify things that are abominations. You say they're natural. You say it's okay. You say this is how I believe. I, I, don't, I don't think it's wrong. I can't imagine what the world was like before the law of Moses. And so one of the purposes was to make sin known. With the law came wrath. That put a restraint on sin, punishment. One of the things we're looking at, we're fixing to probe into a little deeper here in a minute, is that the purpose of the law was to strengthen sin. And that used to be the most confusing thing for me. I almost hesitate to say it in passing now because I know there's always new people watching and, and some of you aren't new, but you're still just watching. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think you know, the purpose of the law is to make sin strong. This is why you better learn what it means not to be under it because sin is strengthened with law. What happens when you sin and you have no law, you harden your heart and you deaden yourself to sin. And you just sin more. And have you figured out yet? I've been preaching it for years, but some of you, I think, are just catching up. Have you figured out that sin doesn't have a bottom? What is, what is horrible today will be okay next year. And what is unthinkable today will be thinkable all day. In a year, it just, it's a bottomless pit. And so there's a point if there's no law, that sin hardens the heart to where you are doing, you're, you're sleeping with animals saying it's okay. God had to deal with entire cultures. 
The Canaanites. Who, who, who slept with animals celebrating it. Marching down the street with signs. We love our animals. See, you, you look at me today like I'm crazy, but 10 years ago I said some things you thought I was crazy. 20 years ago I said some things you thought I was crazy. What the law did was strengthen sin in you so that you don't die in your sin and experience the sting of death. What the law did was make your sin known. It strengthened sin on the inside of you <clears throat> where you could repent and now not die in your sins. And so, there's a place for the law even today. Timothy talked about, or in the book of Timothy, Paul told Timothy that the law is a good thing if a man uses it lawfully. And then he told you who the law is for. There's some bad people in that list. <laughs> but that it's not made for a righteous man. Tell him I'm just getting started. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am so sorry. No, no, no. I repent. It just came out. I just, it didn't bother me, and I, I'm sorry. I wouldn't embarrass anybody on purpose for nothing. <laughs> Including myself. Uh, okay, what does it mean, I come to fulfill it, not destroy it? We certainly don't need it destroyed today. We need to know it. Understand how we're not under it, but let people know this right here is wrong and it'll, 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 it'll bring a sting to death. So how did he fulfill it? Number one, number one, how did Jesus fulfill the law? And, and, and I don't know that I have all the answers to this, but the three I have, the Holy Spirit's taught me. Number one, he fulfilled it by keeping it. He's the only human being that has ever kept it. The writer of it, Moses, didn't keep all of it. No one has ever kept the law but Jesus. He kept every letter, crossed every T, dotted every I. He fulfilled it by keeping it, the only human being that has ever kept it, able to keep, keep it, and did keep it. And listen, here's, here's the mystery. He didn't keep it for himself. He kept it for you. Just like he didn't die for himself, he died for you. He had no death of his own. He took your death. His obedience was as a substitute on our behalf. He didn't just die as me and for me. He lived for me and as me. That'll hit you later. Because to this day, I'll go into churches. I mean, it just amazes me. And people will literally say, well, how do I claim the blessings of Deuteronomy 28? Because I know I'm not perfect. Because it says, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and observe to do according to all that I have written in this book of the law, then you shall be blessed. So you either have to deceive yourself to get those blessings. Well, I've kept it. No, you, you kept stupidity. <laughs> or you have to understand faith is, I believe in what Jesus did for me, as me, and because my Jesus diligently hearkened unto the voice of the Lord his God, and Jesus observed to do according to all that was written therein, my faith in Jesus causes these blessings now to overtake me, and I'm thankful to Jesus. I can claim the blessings of the law because of Jesus fulfilling it, not just for me, but as me. Amen. Number two, Jesus fulfilled it by becoming the substance of all the types and shadows. Jesus is the substance of all the types and shadows of all the law. Jesus is the Lamb of God 
that taketh away the sin. Jesus is all the sacrifices, the offerings. Jesus is now even the substance to the Sabbath, the most holy thing that has ever happened on this planet is the Sabbath. It didn't even, and wasn't even introduced under the law of Moses. It began in the garden. That Jesus has become our Sabbath rest. Jesus fulfilled all the Sabbaths, all the offerings. See, a shadow has no substance. It is the cast of substance. Jesus has always been the substance behind all the cast shadows. And he fulfilled the law by bringing the substance to every type and every shadow in the Old Covenant law. Number three. How did Jesus fulfill the law? By satisfying the claims and demand of the law, the soul that sins must die. When you look at the law from 30,000 feet up, the bottom line is you die because of your sins or a substitute dies on your behalf. The law demanded death for sin. And how did Jesus fulfill it? By embracing my death. He didn't just take my sins. He died my death. And David sees this, and this is what I shared in my testimonial that people wanted me to explain a little deeper, was David sees this. David had a revelation of grace that was over the top. I've struggled with grace a little bit. Anybody else struggle with grace? And to think of us struggling on this side of the cross versus him understanding grace under the law is fascinating to me. And in one of our favorite Psalms, 23, David declaring the mercies of God, the goodness of God, the loving kindness of God. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And he talks about a table spread before his enemies and his cup overflowing and God's goodness and mercy following him all the days of his life. Notice he said, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow. Everybody say shadow. The shadow of death. See, he understood the cross, the grace of God, and that death for a believer is but a shadow Shadows have no substance. Jesus took the substance of death, and if he tarries and that last trump does not sound soon, you and I will just be going through the valley of the shadow of death. There'll be no sting, there'll be no pain. I'm not saying they're in pain up to death, and there aren't things that we go through in this life that bring pain right up to death. I'm saying death for a Christian, death for a believer is but a shadow. It's a simple doorway into the next realm and the very presence, unveiled presence of Jesus Christ. The reason it's a shadow, <laughs> and I experienced that valley and the shadow of what we call death is because again our precious Lord our precious Savior didn't just take your sin He took the sting of death out and you that believe you'll never die 
What do I mean? Do I mean you won't leave this body if the Lord tarries? No. If anybody believed in the resurrection, Lazarus did. Isn't that right? I mean, that dude was a believer. I don't think he had a shadow of doubt. Mary and Martha became believers. And guess what? They're not with us now. Lazarus went on to die physically again. Yet Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll never die. How many of you know not only has the sting of death been taken out into the body of Jesus, the strength of the law has been removed because of him fulfilling it on your behalf. Let's close real quick with Romans 8. I could quote this real quick. It's one of my favorite passages in my personal walk. So, But let's read it together. Romans chapter 8. Everybody's familiar with Galatians 3.13? Christ hath redeemed me from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. You're redeemed from the curse of that law because Jesus took your curse at the cross. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Notice there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We need to get everybody saved. We need to get everybody in Christ Jesus so there will be no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. God condemned your sin in the flesh of Jesus. Why did He do that? That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What Jesus did brought the fulfillment of the law into my life and into my heart. God looks at you, brothers and sisters. He looks at me and He sees us sinless. He sees us made righteous by faith and He sees us delivered from the law by grace. Amen. Well, that's just hard on the carnal mind because everybody else sees you after the flesh at large. There's a couple of people that have seen me after the Spirit in my life. But most people just see me after the flesh. <laughs> I get tickled and I tickle people sometimes when they talk about loving us and loving each other. And we just love you, Pastor. It's because you don't know me. <laughs> if you love me, it's because you don't know me. Amen. You ever, you ever, come on. It's like somebody gets to know you, the more they get to know you, the less they seem to love you. Aren't you glad God's not that way? He knows everything about you and still loves you. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm excited that the sting of death is gone and the strength of the law is removed. And I'm living by faith in the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Father, I love you. <clears throat> I love these precious people.